Welcome to Imbutu Storytellers. In this holiday season, we're bringing you a show that is holiday centric. Our first teller comes from Detroit, Larry Castleberry. The first story entitled Bootsy. You will hear the last Christmas parade from Jesri McConnell Courtney. And Shoshana Simpson will be bringing us a story about heartbreak. We're excited to introduce a teller brand new to Ubuntu Storytellers, Miss Jolyn Walker, her Kwanzaa celebration. Following Jolyn, we will have moi and my story called Christmas is Just Around the Corner. We're closing out tonight with Miss Elizabeth Anton. Ubuntu Storytellers is a team of professional storytellers who have black or brown identity in their ancestry. And we exist to tell stories of being as well as stories of being in the skin we're in. But what we have discovered in our walk, just in our daily lives, that if you only know me by my heroism and or my victimization, do you really know me at all? So Ubuntu Storytellers exist to bring you the stories of walking and the lives and the day by day. You will hear stories of discrimination and racism because that's part of our journey. You'll also hear stories that at the end you'll say, huh, that could have been me, no matter what your racial or ethnic or gender identity. Did he come yet? Oh, I know it's dark outside, but I also know it's morning. Did he come? I get out the bed. I creep into the dining room where I see two coffee cups with the residue of coffee and in between them, a plate of cookie crumbs. He did come and he talked to my mom and she gave him a great report. I run into the living room and there are my Christmas toys. Oh, not in gift wrap box, but laid out individually on the couch. There's a G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu gripped. There is the bridge of the USS Enterprise with the characters of Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and the beautiful Lieutenant Ahura. Next to that is my S. T.P. Racer. You just pump it up and the motorcycle takes off. But what caught my eye was the toy that was at the end of the couch. Oh, he had red hair, big eyes with the dark black pupils, two cool white horns. It was a red stuffed bull. And I named that bull right then and right there, Bootsy. How did I come up with the name Bootsy for a stuffed red bull? I can't tell you. All I know was that was his name. I took my toys and I played with them. And I went into my mother room to show her where Santa had brought me. She woke up with a smile gave me a kiss on my forehead, walked into the dining room and turned on the radio. And the radio was playing the greatest Christmas song ever made, Donny Hathaway, This Christmas. My mother then proceeded to make breakfast, pancakes and sausage. <laughs> she then came and she poured out the greatest Christmas album ever made, Nat King Cole's the Christmas album, with the first song being the Christmas song. Oh, I ate breakfast and played with my toys and had myself a ball. That night when it was time to go to bed, Bootsy and I got in bed. I took my pillow and I turned it lengthwise so it went the same length as the bed. I then set Bootsy on one of the pillows. He was going to be my bodyguard to watch over me when I slept. Oh, Bootsy and I, we formed a bond. That became my buddy. Oh, yes, I had human friends. But Bootsy, that was my buddy to play with when I had to come in. Wrestling, 
Ah, Bootsy and I would practice. We would watch Bulldog Don Kent, Bobo Brazil, Abdullah the Butcher, and then we would practice those wrestling moves. Pile Driver, Sue Flex. Football season, there was Bootsy and I, pretending like we were Oklahoma with the great quarterback J.C. Watts, or Nebraska in their cool running back, I am hip. And I would show Bootsy how to juke and get away from defenders. And I would show him how to make the cool tackles. When somebody tried to break into our house, it was Bootsy who was on the bed that I turned and looked at. Oh, now Bootsy didn't get up and protect me, no. But he looked at me there on the bed and he gave me this mental message of, I can't move, but you can and you better. Oh, we all have some fond memories of our best Christmas. But when I think of Christmas, I think of the Christmas that Santa Claus via my mother gave me my buddy. Let's see. Voices and footsteps, big and small, fill up the playground of St. Brendan's School in the lead up to the Christmas parade. The head of our procession is Sister Antoinette, our school's principal. And behind her are the Virgin Mother Mary and her husband, Joseph. Now these roles are reserved for eighth grade girls with a virginal look and a tiny waist and eighth grade boys of superior height. Flanking our parade are the cherubim and they're made up of the kindergartners dressed in little white smocks wearing angel wings of cardboard and silver garland. We file into the church that is warm and welcoming with candlelight and poinsettia plants and the smells of incense and myrrh. We're seated by class year to celebrate the mass of the birth of the baby Jesus. And at the point where the birth of the baby Jesus happens, that's when the shortest and the cutest kindergartner is brought into the church, sitting in a manger on wheels, steered by Sister Natalina with pride up to the altar where the holy couple sit quietly. After the mass is over, we're filed <coughs> down into the church basement to enjoy a delivery pizza feast with juice and soda. And Sister Natalina takes pictures of the Holy Family. When I was in the fifth grade, baby Jesus had a fall. Sister Natalina was called away unexpectedly from her photographer duties. And so baby Jesus hopped up on sugar from pizza and juice and soda, begged Joseph, who was also hopped up on the sugar from pizza and juice and soda for a piggyback ride. And so Joseph obliged baby Jesus and baby Jesus started the work of climbing up Joseph, but slipped after losing his footing and fell and hit the floor very hard. This year I'm in the sixth grade and I can see that things are different. As we file into the church, I can see all the way in the front on the altar in a manger is a ceramic baby Jesus. I know why these changes have been made, but honestly, I miss the pomp in the presentation of our kindergarten baby Jesus. But if it means that our celebration will not be stained with injury, it's a tradition I'm willing to part with. Mass goes as planned, and once again, we file into the church basement to enjoy our delivery pizza feast and juice and soda. This time though, Sister Natalina doesn't take photos of the Holy Family. She instead goes and takes her time moving the baby Jesus from his manger on the altar in the church to his other manger in our school hallway opposite the main entrance 
to sleep in heavenly peace. We go on Christmas break, and when we return, we have to spend that first full week at indoor recess. Now, this happens when the weather is just too messy outside for us to play, but indoor recess is great because we get to take longer with eating our lunches, we get to pull out board games, and we even get to play modified outdoor games. I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm eating my sandwich when I hear a loud thud, and then a louder bang, and then the loudest crash I've ever heard that gets me out of my seat and gets my classmates out of their seats, and we all rush the doors at the front and the back of our sixth grade classroom, all vying for position to try and see what's happening through the square windows out into the hallway. We can't see much, but we hear voices and footsteps. And then suddenly, Sister Natalina swings open the front door of our sixth grade classroom with an urgency, begging us to please take our seats and pray to the sacred heart of Jesus. I realize that a prayer of this magnitude means that there is big time trouble happening outside. After what feels like an eternity, Sister Antoinette can be heard over the loudspeaker. And she tells us that the eighth grade boys played a modified game of football in the school hallway, but they unfortunately decided to use the ceramic baby Jesus as a ball. So during a snap, the quarterback shoots Jesus down the hall, but baby Jesus gets intercepted by the other team. And then the intercepting receiver loses his grip of the baby Jesus, so baby Jesus crashes down onto the floor. And then not to get any shards on him, the intercepting receiver backs into the intended receiver, who is standing less than a millimeter in front of a grand statue of the sacred heart of Jesus. The intended receiver knocks into the sacred heart of Jesus, which then begins to teeter forward and backward, and side to side, before falling diagonally onto the floor in the school hallway, losing its head. <laughs> Rumors swirled for weeks that the eighth grade boys in question were not only expelled from school, they were also excommunicated from the Catholic faith. But one thing was clear, the Christmas season at St. Brendan School was forever changed. There were no more Christmas parades into the church before the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And that delivery feast of pizza and juice and soda, well, it just evolved to delivery pizza. Those Christmas parades were a point of pride for the sisters because for them, celebrating with us was like celebrating with family, but we didn't understand that. And we didn't even understand that that grand statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus was put in that school hallway to protect us spiritually. Now, I don't remember if the statue was ever restored, but I do remember a miniature version that was placed in its stead, and man, did we laugh at that thing until it was finally taken away. I can finally see the love that the sisters poured into our Christmas celebration so many years removed from those parades. And that last Christmas parade, man, it really was the best. To do always as much as we can in the way that we can, in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than when we inherited it. I first heard those exact words over 30 years ago as an African dancer and a new staff men member at a prestigious school right here in Connecticut. Actually, right here in Wallingford. I was asked to perform a dance for their Kwanzaa program. 
I was asked by an English teacher, and her name was Miss Matthews, but I get to call her Connie. Connie is about six feet tall, and I barely make five feet. So together, working, and we're still friends today, we made an odd couple. Everyone loved Connie. The students, the faculty, the teachers. I would describe her as a gentle giant. Whenever she had to make corrections, she was straight to the point, but she did it in such a gentle manner. One would have to concede to her suggestions. There were no arguments, only transformations. So when she asked me, would I do the welcome dance for Kwanzaa? I said yes. After all, I know what Kwanzaa is all about. We are now five weeks away from the program. I received the details, the date, the place, the time, and the rehearsal place. I busied myself with choosing the music and what I wore. I wore a black leotard and black tights. Around that, I would wrap beautiful African material around my waist to create a skirt or a lapa. A matching piece of the material would go around my head for a head wrap or a gale. I was all ready. The music I chose was to the song Jingoloba by the famous Nigerian drummer Babatunde Olatunji. It goes something like this Jingo, a jingopa, a jingopa, ba, go ba. I practiced my dance and I was ready. Soon, it was time for the rehearsal date. Both the rehearsal and the actual program took place at the school's chapel. So as I entered the chapel for the first time for rehearsal, I walked in and it was very dim and cold in the chapel. I looked at the rows of pews. They were nice and clean and brown. I looked at the stained glass windows. Everything just looked sterile. So I continued down the aisle and I met the other participants at this large wooden altar table at the front. And there were the participants who were students and Connie was there too. She was giving out directions. And when she saw me, she said, Jolyn, you're second on the program. I took an opportunity. I asked, when I rehearse my dance, can I leave? She said, yes. I said to myself, after all, I know what Kwanzaa is about. I rehearsed the dance, took a few notes, and left. Now it's a few days later, and the program is starting, and I decided to get to the chapel this time ahead of time before anyone else got there. I wanted to get used to the atmosphere, knowing it was going to be cold and dim. But this time, unlike rehearsal, when I walked through the doors, it was so bright in there, and it was warm. I think they turned on the heat. <laughs> The light drew me to the front of the chapel, and I saw the brown altar table. It was now draped in beautiful African fabric. On top of the fabric was a straw mat. On top of the mat was a wooden candle holder called a canara, and it held the seven candles. There was still room on the mat, for a wooden cup that they call a unity cup. To the left of that was a huge basket that was overflowing with fruits and vegetables. Well, there were apples and oranges, 
bananas, pineapples, pomegranates. There were carrots with tops on them, turnips, sweet potatoes, and so much more. I looked around and said, this place has been transformed. A few minutes later, others came and we greeted each other. The other participants came in with their African garb. We saw colorful dashikis. The young ladies had on African gowns and some also had what I was wearing, African material over their long sleeve leotards. We checked in with, with each other, hugged each other and said, are you ready? Are you ready? And just as we did that, there was a rumble of footsteps. We looked to the back of the chapel and in came all the attendees. It looked as if the entire school was coming to the program. I wasn't ready for that and nerves sat in. As I looked around, I realized everyone got into their seats pretty quickly and nearly every seat was taken. There were students, staff members, faculty. I gathered myself and walked to the back of the chapel so I can dance down the aisle. But as I walked, I made <coughs> sure I took a few breaths to just calm my nerves. As I got to the back of the chapel, it all happened so fast. The program started. They said, welcome to the Kwanzaa program to the audience. A small and brief history about Kwanzaa was given and all of a sudden she said, we will now start the celebration with the welcome dance. And on cue, the music started. Jingo, a jingo ba, a jingo ba, go ba ba go ba. I jingle bob myself down that aisle. And as I danced, I happened to glance at people in the audience. And it was so beautiful to see their smiles. And some of them were clapping to the beat. I made my way down to the front of the chapel, faced the audience. At that time, I changed and did three different steps. Then the music was fading. That was my cue to move off to the side and take my seat and watch the rest of the program. Before I can get there, the music ended. What happened next was a rousing applause that was so overwhelming to me, it felt like the wind had blew in my face. But I found my way over to my seat and sat down. And I said, now I can watch the rest of the program. After all, I know what Kwanzaa is all about. The rest of the program continued with poetry. There was hand clapping gospel songs and a student off offered a reflection. The next thing that happened was so important that I never forgot it till this day. It was now time to light the seven candles according to the Kwanzaa principles. Seven students from diverse backgrounds got up and walked behind the altar table. And one by one, they spoke the principle in Swahili language, gave the meaning and description, and then lit the corresponding candle. Umoja. Umoja means unity. They gave the description and said, I now light the candle for unity. And that went on until the sixth principle. The sixth principle is kuumba. Kuumba means creativity. They gave the description and lit the candle for creativity. The seventh and final principle is Imani. And Imani means faith. Faith in your parents, your teachers, your community, and hope for the future. And they lit the corresponding candle. 
As I sat there, I realized I didn't know everything that I thought I knew <laughs> about Kwanzaa. I went back to that sixth principle, Kuumba. Kuumba means creativity, to do always as much as you can in the way that you can in order to leave your community more beautiful and beneficial than when you inherited it. That was the first time I heard those exact words. From that point on, I used the principle of Kuumba <clears throat> as a guiding principle in my life. Now I say to do always as much as I can in the way that I can in order to leave my community more beautiful and beneficial than when I inherited it. Yes, I was transformed. Ashe. A few nights after Christmas in 2001, I was spending the night at my best friend's house in Brooklyn. We were leaving for a fun Pennsylvania ski weekend. Sleeping nestled in the blankets on her bedroom floor. I was jolted awake by the sound of my cell phone ringing. Groggily, I reach for it and I look at the number on the screen and I smile because it's my boyfriend's number. I've been looking to hear from him all day. Like, what was he doing? But it was also close to three o'clock in the morning. Was he drunk calling me? I clear my throat. <clears throat> Hello, I answer. Hello, says the female voice on the other line. In my hazy th state, I think, <laughs> I must have dialed the wrong number. So I disconnect the phone, I hang it up, I wrap myself in the blankets and go back to sleep thinking, huh, what a weird dream I'm having. When my eyes snap open and I realize, wait a minute, I didn't call anyone. I reach for the phone again, I look through the call log and I see that the last number was in fact from my boyfriend's phone number. But there's no way that there's a woman calling from my book. You know what? I hit redial. Hello, says the female voice again. Who is this? I demand. <laughs> Diana, she says. And my heart sings. I know who she is. The year before, during my senior year in college, my best friend from high school, Vancha, called to tell me that she thought there was something going on between a recently hired employee and my boyfriend at the movie theater that they worked at. Who is she, I'd ask. Diana. She's a high school student, but they spend a lot of time together, they go into rooms together, and you know, I just don't trust it. Are you sure, I asked her, because she had to be mistaken, because my boyfriend loved me. There was no way he was cheating on me. I said, you know what, Shauna? I don't trust it. And in that moment, I decide I'm gonna break up with him, because Vancha has no reason to lie to me. She's the one who introduced me to my boyfriend, and I also don't want to be one of those women who don't believe their friends when their friends tell you that boyfriend's cheating on them. <laughs> I'm not stupid. So the next time that Omar comes over to my dorm room, he sits on the bed and I move to the dorm room floor and I start playing with the carpet because I don't know how I'm supposed to say this, how I'm supposed to come out. So I just brought out, who's Diana? Why do you ask? So as I'm explaining to him why I'm asking, the phone in my dorm room rings. I answer, hello? Shauna, he's not cheating on you, don't break up with him, Vancha says. <laughs> Holding the phone, I look at her, I'm looking at him and I say, are you sure? Yeah, girl, you know, I misunderstood. You know, he's not cheating on you, girl, mm -mm, don't break up with him. <laughs> and because it's actually what I wanna hear, I believe her. And when he tells me that Diana is just an employee and there's nothing going on between them, I believe him. Obviously, he lied. <coughs> Where's Omar? I asked Diana. She disconnects the line. At this point, my friend Tanisha is up and she wants to know what's going on. So I fill her in on my nighttime caller. And when I'm done, she says, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go there? Yes. Yes, I do. So Tanisha and I quickly get dressed and I drive us from Brooklyn to the Bronx to go see Omar and his side piece. <laughs> Leaving Tanisha in the car, I walk up 
the walkway and oh my God, my stomach is bubbling. <sighs> what am I supposed to say? What if I knock on the door and he doesn't answer it and then I stand out there looking stupid? What, wait, what if she answered the door? Oh, hell no. I bang on the door like I'm the police. And Omar opens up the door just as far as the security chain will allow. We lock eyes. Open the door, I tell him. Omar releases the security chain and opens the door wide. I walk in and I sit on the couch. I say, so tell me, what's going on here? He says, obviously you know what's going on here. And I'm taken aback because I was hoping he'd say, it's not what you think, that was my sister, or someone's playing a joke, anything to convince me that what is happening is not happening. But he can't even give me that. So I tell him, give me my stuff. Because for Christmas, he had bought me some mats for my car and some other stuff, and I really saw no reason for me not to have them. <laughs> he goes to the back room, gets the stuff, gives it to me, and I start walking towards the front door. Is that it, he asks. Did you have something else you wanted to say? He says nothing. I keep walking. As I'm walking back towards my car now, it's starting to sink in. He is actually cheating on me. I can't believe this is happening. And did his family who live upstairs, they know the entire time? Oh gosh, I feel like an idiot. I throw my stuff in the trunk and I drive off. All the while, Omar's watching from the front door. And now that fun Pennsylvania ski weekend, I am holding back my tears the entire time and pretending I'm having a good time. But really, I just wanna go home and cry. When I come back from the trip, Omar calls. He wants to talk, see if we can work things out. And I'm sure I, I'm willing to talk because I have questions, he has answers. So I return to the scene of the crime. I sit on the couch and I look at him and he looks at me and he says, <coughs> it was supposed to be a fling, but somehow I caught feelings and I didn't know how to tell you, but I still love you. As he's sharing his truth, I'm holding back my tears because I don't want them to fall because if they fall, then he won and I can't have him win. When he's done with his true confession, we sit in silence. And then he starts laughing, hysterically. And I'm starting to freak out because I'm like, is this some kind of psychotic break? <laughs> and then he says, I figured it out, Shauna. I figured it out. I'm like, what did you figure out? He gets up, he kneels in front of me, and he says, marry me, Shauna. You have to marry me. No, I'm not gonna marry you. You can't even get this right. I get up and I leave him in that apartment. But I don't leave him because I still love him and I still have hope that this can work out. So when he calls me, I answer. When he wants to hang out, I'm available. When I spend the night, I wake up the next morning, I make breakfast, I sing, I dance to show how fun I am. When he comes home from work and he's having a hard day, I have dinner ready, I tell him how everything's gonna be okay to show him how nurturing I am. Everything he asks of me and things he didn't, I do with a smile because I know that once I show him a happier, better version of me, that he will stop cheating on me with her and he will finally choose me. But he never did. Many years ago, a friend's six-year-old daughter runs into her mother's kitchen, winded and looking both confused and bitterly disappointed. Before she could be questioned, she blurts out, I went around the corner and Christmas isn't there. Her mother, stifling a laugh, says, and? And you told me last night when I asked you, when will Christmas finally be here? You said, oh, it's just around the corner. And, and I just went, I just looked and it wasn't there. Well, of course, my friend takes this moment 
to talk to her daughter about the true meaning of Christmas. And she shares with her that Christmas is a really a feeling that resides in our heart all the time. Christmas is something we can access whenever we want. It's a feeling of joy and love and community. And it's there, and it, it, you, it's there, you can access it whenever. It can be around the corner, because you carry it in your heart. <laughs> well, what about the gifts, she persists. Oh, yeah, yeah, the gifts. Well, the, the gifts, the gifts are the gifts that we receive, and we give gifts to others because we love them. You understand that, right? Yes, I buy gifts for Daddy and for Sissy because I love her. And there's also the gift of receiving. When people give to us, it is out of love that we get, that we, they give, and it's, we learn to receive in that spirit of love. She ponders this. I'm not sure she really gets it. And I'm not sure she gets it because I'm a lot older than six, and it's many, many decades before I really get it. Now, I consider myself a woman of great faith. And in that basket of personal basket of goodness that I like to think I carry, I have love and joy and hope and faith and community. And so I realized many, many, many decades later that I really learned the lesson that my friend was sharing with her daughter. You see, let me tell you a little bit about Christmas when I was a child. Now, Christmas Eve in our house, for some reason, my parents didn't get a tree until Christmas Eve. Now, as I think back, maybe it was monetary in their early marriage. Maybe they didn't have the money for a tree until Christmas Eve. But whatever the reason, we didn't care. It was a glorious night that we had Christmas Eve. Now, my mother would be in the kitchen baking. And my older brother and his friends would be in his bedroom doing God knows what. And me, I meant that I had the television to myself. And my dad was out. I realized later, probably tree hustling. So I would curl up in his leather chair in anticipation of the show that I watched every Christmas Eve. I couldn't wait for it to come on. And everybody was exactly where I wanted them. Not with me. The show called The Spirit of Christmas, and there were two stories. The first story was a reenactment of the Twas the Night Before Christmas, and that was fun. But the story that I really loved was about the birth of Jesus. And this must have been a really, really low budget show because the cast was marionettes. And even before HD, I could see the strings that guided them. And as they walked herkly jerkly towards Bethlehem, I don't know, there was, there was something about the primitiveness of it. I think that's what made me love the show. I watched as they laboriously trudged along in faith, only to be banished and turned away when they got there. This show was the highlight of my Christmas until my dad came in with a beautiful tree and we all trimmed the tree and had a beautiful Christmas Eve together as family. Well, when I had my own family, my husband knew the tradition of my family and he agreed that we could put the tree up Christmas Eve. Even if we could afford one sooner, he kind of liked that. And so we started our own tradition and our tradition went like this. We baked cookies the only time I baked all year. We popped popcorn. We had the stockings hung on the bark mantle, and they were stuffed with gifts that the kids could actually open that night. And we trimmed the Christmas tree. Well, after we trimmed the Christmas tree, remember those little silver and white glossy books with the Christmas carols inside? Well, we had one for every member of our family, and we sang robustly, and cheerfully and really, really badly. And it's really a toss up as to who had the worst voice, me or my husband. But it was a Trish tradition that we just loved. And that's how we spent our Christmas Eve. After trimming the tree and singing, kids would open the gifts in the Christmas stockings and off to bed they would go. Well, 
decades after that incident with my friend and her daughter. It's in the early 90s, and I'm in some stage of divorce, and it's Christmas Eve. Now, as Christmas Eve had been approaching, I knew that I could honor the tradition of baking the cookies. I knew that I, we could pop the popcorn and drink hot chocolate. I knew that I could secure those glossy books and that we could sing with me now, the only one with a bad voice, all the songs jubilantly from the good. But I was really concerned about that Christmas tree. Now, I wasn't yet employed when I was married. I was a full-time mom and a full-time community volunteer. And I had put enough way enough money to get a Christmas tree, but we always got a blue spruce Christmas tree, and I wasn't sure that I could afford that level of tree. But I tried to take confidence in the fact that my children probably didn't know the difference. But I didn't know how we could get a Christmas tree home, even if I had the money. Christmas Eve was here, you know. I felt a lot like Mary and Joseph, herkly, jerkly, laboriously making it to the Christmas spirit. Well, the day approached. I went to the neighborhood store around the corner from us, Prime Market, to pick up the turkey and the duck that I had ordered for Christmas. As Nick, the owner, is carrying the bags into the car, he says to me, Miss Page, did you get your Christmas tree yet? What? We have lived in that neighborhood for over a decade. I went to Nick's store three or four times a week to get the butcher cuts and the fresh products. He had never asked me such a thing. What made him ask? And you know, this was a time when I hadn't shared with anyone my current status. So I had this big basket of goodness of qualities that I like to think I carried around with me. There were obviously a few missing because I don't know if it was pride or shame or guilt, but something kept me from telling my family and my closest friends what was going on. If I had, I would have had support. I wouldn't have had to worry about how I get the tree. But you see, it wasn't just getting the tree. You got to get the tree up the stairs. We lived in a big Victorian house with great big high ceilings, so we had a great big tree. Who was going to cut the trunk and stand it up straight and address the lights and test the lights and fix the broken lights and put the angel on top? None of us could do that. I wondered why Nick asked if I had a tree. Well, he gestures to the few unsold trees in his small parking lot. And he points very specifically at the one remaining blue spruce. And he says to me, I'd be honored, Mrs. Page, if you'd allow me to gift you with this tree. Well, I wanted to say no because I still had all these other hurdles. But before I could say anything, he said, and if you come back, Right before closing, I'll have one of my employees help you get it home. Okay, I thought, that's part of the problem. I think Nick, I nodded as if I was in agreement. But by the time I got home, I knew I wasn't going to accept that tree. What was the employee going to do? Tie it on top of my car? Who was going to get it off the car when I got home? Again, who was going to bring it up the stairs? Who was going to trim the trunk so it could stand in the tree? Who was going to fix the broken lights? Having a tree was only half the battle. Well, I go in the house and I'm really now heavy laden with this burden of the tree. And my children come home from school, early dismissal for the holiday. I perk myself up and go to hug them, and as I do, they say, Mom, we've been talking, and it's okay that we don't have a tree this year. <laughs> don't have a tree? Are you crazy? Our whole tradition is around that tree. What kind of nonsense are you talking? The tree's already picked out. It's at Prime Market. We're going to go get it right before closing. And with that, we go into the kitchen to start the cookie baking. 
And I'm trying not to concern myself with all the other mechanics around the tree and really throw myself into the thrill of this annual tradition with my children. As we're just about to wrap up the last batch of cookies, my son looks out the window and says, it's snowing. And I look to see the good powdery snow, that good sledding snow. And I knew I was witnessing the second miracle of Christmas. The first being Nick gifting us with the tree. And so <coughs> finished with the cooking, baking, 10 minutes before five, my son, my daughter, the sled and I make our way to Prime Market. When we get there, his employee, as promised, ties the tree onto the sled and offers to come home with us to bring it up the stairs. But I thought, I've already witnessed two Christmas miracles. I'm just going to believe that there's a third that doesn't involve your having to change your holiday plans. And so the three of us with the sled, we make it back to our house and we're singing loudly, Oh, Christmas tree! Oh, Christmas tree, how lovely art thou branches, jubilantly. Just as we're about to approach our house, my neighbor, Mike, from two doors down, comes out. He sees us. He looks at the tree on the sled and he says, yes, but the big, jubilant fist pump. Yes, I say to him, yes, Carol got an artificial tree this year. She didn't discuss it with me. She just came home with that thing. And she deprived me of the annual manly ritual of cursing the standing of the tree. Please allow me. And I did. <laughs> Later that evening, the tree standing straight in the stand, fully trimmed, the popcorn popped, cookies devoured, the carols sat badly sung. I'd sit in the living room as my children are in bed having unwrapped their Christmas stocking gifts. And I think back to the time that my friend said, Christmas is just around the corner and you can access it anytime if you carry it in your heart. And I thought this year, Christmas really was around the corner for me because this was the year that I learned to receive with joy. Last winter, I decided I was gonna learn how to ice skate again. So I joined the local rink and began taking lessons. Now, I used to be pretty good, <laughs> but the last time I'd been ice skating was when I used to go with my grandpa and I was about this big. I wobble onto the ice, gripping the edges. And no matter, in my mind, I'm gliding across, dancing across the ice, and I feel just like a princess. Princess is what my grandpa used to call me. I, mi princesita, he would say, and spread his arms wide open and wait for me to jump into them before hugging me. And that was every morning when my mother dropped me off at their house before she went to work. Mi princesita, my little princess. I'll never forget. We had a game that we played every day. It was my favorite game. It was called Shopping in the Kitchen. And what we did was we rolled a layer of Play-Doh, pink, it had to be pink Play-Doh. And I had a, um, a coin-shaped cookie cutter. It looked like a penny. And I would press the penny down onto the Play-Doh and my grandpa, he would wipe the edges, right? He would clear the edges and help me put my penny into the bank. And each time I made a penny, he would help me count how many I had in the bank. And when I got to 10, I was allowed to go shopping in the kitchen. So in the kitchen, I would spend two cents for a glass of milk and one penny, one cent for each cookie. And my grandpa would help me add up how much it was that I owed for my stuff. And then he would help me count how much I had left. And this is why when I went to Head Start about 
couple of years, maybe a year later, I was three, I already knew how to add and subtract. The irony of this is that when my grandfather came to America in 1924, I think it was 1924, he did not speak English. But not only did he not speak English, he also couldn't read and write. I loved my grandpa. I loved him so much. And one day, my mother came home from work to pick me up, as usual, and I said, I said, Mommy, I love Grandpa so much. I don't care one bit if he's a Negro. The air was sucked out of the kitchen, and I knew, I knew that I was in trouble, that I'd said something bad. My mother's eyes got this big, filled with anger. And she pinched my arm and twisted my flesh and said, your grandfather is not a Negro. And she twisted again and she hissed, he's Indian from Ecuador. And she twisted and twisted until I screamed and started to cry. I just screamed in pain and started to cry and ran to the living room and sobbing. And I, and I threw myself onto the couch and thankfully my grandfather came running after me and he cuddled me and held me in his lap and rocked me until I calmed down. And when I stopped crying, my grandfather told me a story. It was the story of his childhood in Ecuador. Yo me escapé de un orfanato en las montañas de Ecuador, he said. I escaped from an orphanage high in the Andes Mountains. My father was a colonel in the Spanish army, he said. He had big blue eyes and a long blonde mustache that he used to curl at the ends. My mother was the most beautiful Incan princess in Ecuador. And she had long black hair that she would wear tied in a braid. My father and my mother loved each other so much. And my father, my, my father was so sad when my mother died. She died when I was born. And my father, the colonel, he was so sad that he begged the nuns at the orphanage to please take care of me while he was off fighting all his wars. When I was 14, he said, I escaped from the nuns. They used to talk all the time about this famous city. It was the city by the sea, some city that was on the other side of the mountain. We had never seen a city, we had never seen the sea. And I decided when I was 14 that I was going to go find that city by the sea. So I wandered for many days and many nights through a dark, scary forest. One night there was a big black mountain lion that came chasing me, trying to gobble me up. So I climbed a tree as quick as I could, and I stayed up in the tree for three days and three nights. And I couldn't eat or sleep or drink. And that mountain lion wouldn't go away. And that mountain lion was pacing back and forth and back and forth, waiting, waiting to gobble me up. And finally, I got so mad that I shook my fists and I beat my chest and I let out a mighty roar. And that mountain lion was so scared that he ran away. And so, when I got to the edge of the forest, I looked over the mountain and I saw it, the city by the sea, Guayaquil. And the sun was so bright that the water looked like it was sparkling. And there were boats, so many boats, big boats, bigger than this whole apartment, my grandpa said. And I knew, I knew that I had to go see what was inside those boats. 
So I snuck on board, he said, and I hid in a dark room. And that room was filled with food, <gasps> so much food. I had never seen so much food and I ate and I ate and I ate so much that eventually I fell asleep. And when I fell asleep, I woke up and I found that the boat was on its way to America. The crew eventually found me and they put me to work in the galley. I was peeling potatoes. They were really nice to me. And about three months later, when we landed in Manhattan, I got off that boat wearing the only piece of clothing that I owned. It was winter time, you see, and one of the crew members had given me his pea coat. It was a blue pea coat. And in the pocket, I found $11. They had taken a collection, and $11 in 19. 24 is a fortune. I never knew if my grandpa stood in bread lines that winter or if he sheltered in church basements. I don't know. He never said. But what I do know is that my grandpa met my grandma in the Bronx. It was the first Baptist church of the Bronx. She was an immigrant from Puerto Rico. And they met, they married, and they moved into a tiny little apartment and had my mother and my uncle. In fact, it was that very apartment where my grandpa would take care of me. My grandpa never much liked the winter. His tropical blood never, he resisted the need to thicken. He, but he didn't like being cramped indoors either. So he used to take me ice skating. Oh, the fun we had, the fun we had. We would, we would grab each other's hands and wobble across the ice laughing and laughing and laughing. For my seventh birthday, he bought me a pair of ice skates, white, with pink shoelaces and they had pink pom-poms. And I had a pink hat and pink gloves and a pink scarf to match. The joy of ice skating, I think today, helped me get through a lot of the pain and the violence that I was experiencing at home. I think it helped my grandpa, too. My grandfather was the joy of my life. And I wish, I so wish that it could have stayed that way. But when my mother died in 1986, my grandfather and I were estranged. We hadn't spoken in quite a few years at that point. And I have a vivid memory of him kneeling at my mother's coffin, keening, crying, sobbing. Ay, mi hija, mi hija, mi alma, my daughter, my soul. And even though there was one part of me that wanted to go comfort my grandpa, there was another one, stubborn, unforgiving, and so I didn't go. I didn't. The rift happened when I was 16. My mother and I were having one of our knockdown, drag out fights in the kitchen, screaming at each other at the top of our lungs. And my mother, as she would, slapped me across the face. <gasps> and the burning sting and the tear filled eyes. I knew it well, but this time, instead of burying my anger and my shame and my hurt, I dug into that fury and slapped her right back. I was 16 and well past the age when she could beat me with impunity. And this time it was her turn to feel that awful red sting of a slap, to have her eyes fill with tears of shock and anger and pain. I kept screaming at her and screaming and screaming and screaming so loudly that she dared not hit me back. Of course, 
my grandfather came running in to see what was happening. And he stood, first in shock, looking at me, at my mother. And then when he realized that I'd hit my mother, he glared at me. But Grandpa, Grandpa, she hit me first. I tried to explain. He looked at me, and I could see the expression on his face turned to disgust. And he turned on his heel and walked out of the kitchen and walked out of my life. I was devastated. You know, it took me a while, but I, I realized that no matter how much my grandpa loved me, and he did, I had always been princess number two. <laughs> princess number one was my mother. And I was devastated by this. It had never occurred to me that, of course, his loyalties would lie with his daughter. And in my grandpa's world, where he came, his culture, his age, a daughter hitting her mother, simply, that, that, that lack of respect, that simply just wasn't allowed. So, last winter, when I decided that I was going to learn how to ice skate again, I promise you I looked like the Michelin Man. So I have three layers on. My tropical blood hasn't thickened either. Three layers on, and I have wrist protection, I have elbow pads, I have knee pads, I have a pink, cra pink of course, crash helmet. And I also have this diaper-looking thing that is a, a tailbone protector, right? And so I'm, I wobble onto the ice, clinging to the edge, but no matter, because in my mind, I am gliding across that ice in a pink ice skating dress with long sleeves that are fluttering in the breeze as I pick up speed and I close my eyes and I see my grandpa standing at the edge of the rink, his big blue eyes shining with love. And I feel his tender and fierce love, and I know he is still with me. And as I glide across this, the rink, I turn to my grandpa and I say, Grandpa, look at me. Look at me, Grandpa. I am because we are. Thank you. We are human only through the humanity of others.